The task before us is not for the faint-hearted. These are also crime scenes. Where others have failed, I intend to succeed. These incomplete projects they are monuments to inefficient management, corruption. Over several financial years, that number jumps to nearly 3 billion rand in delayed construction projects. One of the most striking examples of these delays is the Telkom Towers project in Swane, where approximately a billion rand was spent on upgrades over 10 years with little to show for it. First and foremost, we are establishing strict consequence management protocols for contractors who fail to deliver. And not just the businesses, the individuals themselves. They belong in jail, not on construction sites. Often referred to as the construction mafia, these criminal syndicates have disrupted countless projects, costing both the public and private sector millions of rands. As I stated shortly after my appointment, we're committed to restoring the rule of law at construction sites across the country. Furthermore, we are... We will then welcome them in their absence. The first item on the order paper today is the statement by the Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure on the delays in completion of infrastructure projects. I now recognize the Honorable Minister. Thank you. Deputy Speaker, members of the National Assembly, over the last four months, many of you in this House and South Africans across the country have lamented the number and cost of delayed infrastructure projects. You have shared stories of how these delays have affected your constituents who had hoped that these schools, clinics, police stations and community centres would restore the dignity that they seek. Beyond this, these delays have hampered the growth and development of our nation's infrastructure, currently costing us close to 3 billion rand in delayed construction projects over a number of financial years. These delays are not just figures in a report. They represent stalled progress, halted economic growth, and deferred services for millions of South Africans. These are also crime scenes where individuals have been paid for work they have not completed. They are crime scenes that have robbed people of hope and a better life. The disruption to construction sites impacts our communities directly. It results in half-finished buildings, idle construction sites, and most importantly, wasted public funds. Funds which could have been used to improve the lives of South Africans. Since my appointment as the minister in July, I have made it my mission to address these delays head on. Today, I will use this opportunity to lay out the root causes of these delays, provide specific examples of affected projects, and share the concrete measures we are taking to address this situation. The task before us is not for the faint-hearted. It requires decisive action, transparency, and accountability. Where others have failed, I intend to succeed because these projects are too important for the communities that have waited far too long for them to be completed. To address this challenge effectively, it is important to understand the extent of the problem we are facing. In this financial year alone, out of a current 206 financial, uh, sorry, infrastructure projects overseen by our department, 164 projects are experiencing delays for a number of reasons. This represents an alarming 79% delay rate across our portfolio for this financial year. These projects are critical to many communities across the country yet they remain incomplete. These delays impact essential services, public safety, and community well-being, from homes and police stations to correctional facilities and hospitals. The financial toll alone is substantial, with an estimated 1.3 billion rand already invested in projects in this financial year that are yet to reach completion. Over several financial years, that number jumps to nearly 3 billion rand in delayed construction projects. These incomplete projects don't just stand as unfinished structures. They are monuments to inefficient management, corruption, lost opportunities, deferred dignity, and unfulfilled promises to the public. One of the most striking examples of these delays is the Telkom Towers project in Swane, where approximately a billion rand was spent on upgrades over 10 years with little to show for it. 
The complex intended to become the SAPS headquarters still has the telecom sign in front of the building 10 years later. Instead of serving the public, this project has become a financial burden, costing the state millions each year for security alone. To avoid further waste of public finances, we are now exploring options to either repurpose this asset or remove it from our portfolio altogether, with an independent investigation underway. This project, amongst many others, highlights a pattern of stalled and mismanaged construction projects that we are determined to address. Another glaring example is the Sarah Bartman Center of Remembrance project in Hankey in the Eastern Cape, launched nearly a decade ago in 2014. To date, 247 million rand has been spent on this project, yet it remains 37% complete, with its budget inflated far beyond its initial scope. The project has been handed over to multiple contractors and each time resulting in additional costs without substantial progress. What is worse is that no one has been held accountable, neither officials in my department nor the contractors involved. This reckless and careless approach is an insult to the legacy of an icon such as Sarah Bachman. Officials and contractors have used her name in vain to satisfy their own greed. There can be nothing more offensive than what has taken place here. And this kind of mismanagement is precisely what we are committed to ending one way or another. Deputy Speaker, to address these issues directly, we are implementing several drastic measures to overhaul the way our department manages, executes and oversees projects. First and foremost, we are establishing strict consequence management protocols for contractors who fail to deliver. Going forward, contractors who do not meet their obligations on time and, with, and within budget will face immediate repercussions, including blacklisting. And not just the businesses, the individuals themselves. They belong in jail, not on construction sites. Our blacklisting policy is straightforward. Contractors who underperform or engage in non-compliant practices will no longer have the privilege, privilege of working on public projects. This decisive action ensures that only competent, reliable contractors can participate in national infrastructure projects. Furthermore, working through the Construction Industry Development Board, we will ensure that only contractors of the appropriate size and with an adequate level of expertise are awarded large construction projects. In, con in conjunction with this, we are enforcing new regulations for tender evaluation to ensure transparency and accountability. By adopting a public-facing system that records the tender process, we are committed to openness and transparency in contractor selection. Moving forward, audio and video recordings will provide a transparent view of how decisions are made, which will prevent any bias or irregularity in the awarding of contracts. This step, modeled after the successful approach in KwaZulu-Natal's Public Works Department, will help us restore trust and ensure that contractors are chosen based on merit and capacity to deliver. Another key contributor to delays has been the lack of enforceable oversight standards within our regulatory framework. We are addressing this by empowering the Council for the Built Environment, or the CBE, to set mandatory standards across the sector. Legislation will require registration from all practitioners in the built environment. We believe this measure will ensure that only qualified Accountable professionals are entrusted with our nation's infrastructure projects. This is not merely a bureaucratic requirement. It is a safeguard for public funds and a commitment to quality. Furthermore, the creation of a contract management unit within our department is another crucial reform. This unit will be responsible for actively managing all contracts by monitoring contract performance to ensure that these projects adhere to budgetary and time constraints. By centralizing contract oversight, we will identify potential issues early, implementing corrective ac actions and holding contractors accountable at every phase of a project. We're additionally developing a pre-approved panel of contractors who have demonstrated their capacity to complete projects on time and within budget. This panel of contractors will also serve as an intervention unit to finish incomplete projects. It will allow the department to select contractors within, from, with proven track records, reducing the risk of project delays and budget overruns. 
However, the challenge of delays does not rest solely with contractors. We have seen that client departments often contribute to these delays by withholding payments to contractors which disrupt project timelines. We're addressing this by establishing pay payment protocols to ensure that client departments meet their financial obligations promptly. Moreover, the 14 billion rand owed to us by user departments must be paid, or else we will be forced to start treating government departments as debtors, and we will apply debtor policies, which may include debt collection or eviction. Delayed payments have been a major source of frustration, resulting in project stoppages and ultimately increased costs. By holding client departments accountable, we're addressing a key bottleneck, ensuring that project funding flows efficiently from start to finish. Deputy Speaker, for too long, the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure has struggled with a skills deficit, undermining our project management capacities. In response, we are making a call for experienced engineers, project managers, managers and construction specialists to rejoin our department. Similar to Eskom's approach, we are reaching out to seasoned professionals with skills needed to oversee complex projects and help us deliver results. It is well known that too many projects have been allocated to too few competent project managers, and the return of these essential skills will help us to resolve this issue. This recruitment drive will play a crucial role in helping us address the close to 3 billion rand backlog in incomplete projects by ensuring we have the expertise required to bring these initiatives to completion. To streamline infrastructure delivery models, we're also enhancing our partnership with Infrastructure South Africa. This partnership will enable us to expedite projects where severe delays have been experienced, leveraging ESA's expertise and their resources. ESA has proven experience in cutting through red tape, removing bureaucratic barriers, and fast-tracking essential projects critical to reducing our backlog and ensuring that projects become shovel-ready without delay. We're additionally working closely with the Auditor General of South Africa to implement live auditing processes. This approach will allow us to address financial and operational issues as they arise, rather than waiting until little can be done to remedy the situation. Regular interim financial statements and live audits will provide a real-time view of project finances, prompting corrective action where necessary. This partnership with the AGSA underscores our commitment to transparency, accountability, and responsible, and responsible fiscal management. One of the key initiatives we're implementing to address project delays is the National Construction Summit on Crime-Free Construction Sites taking place next Tuesday in Durban. The summit will bring together key stakeholders, including the Minister of Police, the Minister of Finance, Public Works MECs from all nine provinces, to develop a comprehensive solution to combat the disruption to construction sites across the country. Often referred to as the construction mafia, these criminal syndicates have disrupted countless projects, costing both the public and private sector millions of rands. As I stated shortly after my appointment, we're committed to restoring the rule of law at construction sites across the country. Furthermore, we are formalizing our approach to public asset management with the introduction of technical task teams in cities across the country. Last week, we signed a first of its kind memorandum of understanding with the Etiguene municipality and the provincial government of KwaZulu-Natal to identify and repurpose neglected state-owned properties in the city. By releasing these properties for request for proposals, we aim to attract private sector investment to revitalize these assets for productive use. This initiative represents a significant shift in how we manage public assets, moving from passive ownership to active utilization. Properties like the police barracks, which have remained vacant for years, will now be considered for refurbishment or repurposing. This will help generate income for the department, attract investment, create jobs, and add value to, local, to the local communities. Deputy Speaker, as we address these deep-seated issues, we're laying the groundwork for a renewed, more effective Department of Public Works and Infrastructure. Every measure we implement, from blacklisting to live auditing, is a step to restoring accountability and ensuring that every project undertaken by this department fulfills its purpose. This commitment is not only to the buildings and structures we erect, but also to the South Africans who rely on these services and the communities that they are meant to serve. Let me be very clear. 
I will not tolerate or accept shoddy work, delayed projects or excuses, whether from officials or contractors. The days of taking advantage of South Africans and crushing their dreams are over. I want to assure the members of this House and South Africa at large that we are committed to overcoming the obstacles that have held back our nation's infrastructure plans. I, as I have mentioned, we have a significant task ahead of us, but I am certain with the determination, transparency, and the rigorous standards we are now implementing, we can bring an end to the severe delays that have played in construction projects across the country. Deputy Speaker, Honourable Members, we are truly building a better South Africa, one where public assets genuinely serve the public good, and every infrastructure project lays the foundation for future growth and for opportunity. We are creating a South Africa where the era of wasting public funds on projects that run over time and over budget comes to an end. I encourage you, Honourable Members, to work with us as we take action to achieve this goal. This is our intended purpose. This is our mission to build South Africa together. I thank you.